Well, good morning. Um, I can directly take up from the discussion before because uh, uh, points that have been made uh, by Jeff, for instance, uh, and Mike about the um, awareness uh, for climate change and adaptation needs uh, at the uh, US uh, Atlantic coast, there are definitely some similarities uh, with the German uh, coastal region. And coming back to the discussion last night where uh, we had uh, discussed uh, different, kind of different levels of uh, awareness, I can say that on a national level in Germany, climate change is very high up on a priority list on a national level. But on a local level, it looks different. And therefore, um, it is a hard, uh, a hard uh, work to uh, be um, down in the local communities uh, along the Baltic coast and uh, try to convey the messages about climate change and adaptation. And that's why I put these question marks behind the successful because we are still in the process uh, and we will see uh, what's, uh, how successful will, uh, the work will be um, after a few more years. Uh, generally, uh, this is Kiel Bay Climate Alliance region. So it's the city of Kiel and about 20 more smaller coastal communities. So the issue there is risks, challenges, chances of climate change for these communities. And um, uh, it means that scientific information and scientific advice uh, should be transported uh, to the user community. And who are the users? The users are mayors, decision makers um, at the community level. The planning and the coastal uh, protection authorities at state level, the tourism managers and entrepreneurs at the, in the region, the regional business uh, people, and of course the public, and in particular uh, school children, which uh, we ha have already heard yesterday is important to uh, start uh, with uh, spreading the information about climate change and adaptation very early on. So how does that work? Uh, not really like this with a scientist sitting on a cloud and uh, doing his uh, complicated uh, work, but uh, perhaps rather like this, giving it uh, thorough uh, thoughts about uh, concepts and how things are interlinked and uh, how that uh, uh, the process could possibly uh, put to work. Um, <laughs> please don't uh, take uh, that uh, as a, a personal uh, praising myself, uh, but I, I do uh, mention uh, some basic uh, or uh, yeah, uh, the basic uh, conditions and they have to do with my work in the state of Schleswig-Holstein, which is a small state, has only one university and has only one geography department <laughs> and that helps. Uh, we have uh, done uh, since the 80s uh, coastal uh, work research on, on coastal processes. I've been involved in uh, 1992 in the IPCC uh, coastal management subgroup and we did a vulnerability assessment for the German coast according to the uh, common, common methodology. Uh, <coughs> and in that process I've, or my team, we have established uh, close corporations with the planning and the coastal authorities and uh, also contributed to the coastal master plan with some baseline data. So this is a map from uh, the coastal master plan. Jacobus has been involved in that work 
uh, for a long time. And uh, so uh, what I said about one geography department, the graduates from uh, our department and many uh, former students of mine are now working in communities, in, uh, in institutions, in authorities, as tourism managers, as planners. And so uh, this personal knowledge of uh, people at the decision-making level, of course, that helps. And we have uh, colleagues from other fields who support uh, and contribute to our work. And so uh, I think a scientific reputation and credibility does help in uh, this process that has a lot to do with communication. So uh, one uh, uh, first step is to uh, provide some information and to create awareness to the uh, coastal uh, uh, communities and the inhabitants and the decision makers about the effects of climate change. Of course, the, the basic facts, the regional relevance. Uh, we have uh, under the Climate Service Center and the Helmholtz Center, we have an institution that prepares data for regional uh, climate uh, uh, the, uh, projections. And uh, so uh, these data are fairly well established for on a regional level. Uh, uh, it, important, of course, is how does these, uh, or how do climate change projections, or might they affect communities and households? And uh, what are the implications for uh, costs and benefits to the communities? And this is what we help to get out, <laughs> uh, an awareness and a readiness to uh, continue um, with uh, proactive work. First, uh, I think it's, uh, it's always a, a, a weighing, a balancing between problems and interests. Uh, at the uh, uh, level of these uh, coastal communities. So at first, the problems, uh, we have mentioned these, uh, of course, several times, also just before in the discussion round. Uh, Sandra has mentioned uh, some, and so these are the possible impacts that we uh, try to explain. Uh, and there are some obvious signs for these processes and for these changes, as you can see on the picture. Then there are uh, the short-term weather impacts. We also just mentioned that. Uh, heat waves, um, precipitation, extreme storminess. There is some indication that uh, storms in the North Sea uh, do uh, um, uh, increase in frequency, uh, but uh, it's not a very strong signal yet. And uh, something that uh, you might not uh, expect to be a real issue, but it is uh, organic matter on the beaches. Uh, and after a storm like this, you may end up with uh, a half a meter or a meter of seaweed and organic matter, and uh, that uh, <coughs> starts to <coughs> uh, disintegrate and uh, rot uh, quickly and then it smells and it keeps the tourists away from the beaches. So it needs to be, the beaches need to be cleaned and that's a, a very uh, expensive measure for many small coastal communities. So these were the problems, but of course they are interests. And the interests are with tourism. Uh, mainly uh, possibility of extended summer season with climate change, warmer water temperatures might uh, uh, also help. And of course, the, the coastal landscape and the beaches uh, should uh, be considered as attractions uh, for 
tourists from uh, from uh, the region, but also from further away. We heard uh, from uh, Dietmar that uh, uh, the, his uh, village hopes to get more tourists from uh, uh, the Italian region where it's warm, but I think the tourists that go to the beach in Italy won't necessarily go to the mountains in Austria. They might rather go to another beach where it's not so, <laughs> not so hot. So anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, we will uh, wait and see. Uh, but uh, uh, one aspect uh, that uh, we are now trying to um, uh, put more emphasis on is uh, if we can establish uh, the image of a climate-friendly region as uh, the community of uh, Virgen has already achieved, then uh, I think this uh, will give a, or could give a boost. And uh, there are many uh, tourists in Germany that are ecologically minded and uh, oriented, so that could help. And uh, overall, uh, of course, an increase in tourism might sustain local economy. Uh, to take up what uh, Andreas just said, he is of course right. Uh, if we look at uh, coastal erosion, we should not put the uh, tourism or enforce the tourism uh, infrastructure uh, at, the, at the water's front. So the questions are, I go through that quickly, uh, that we are faced with. Uh, how can negative effects be avoided? How can we capitalize on the positive effects? What about the costs? How can maintenance costs be minimized? and so on and so forth. So uh, these questions are interlinked and we are trying to tell the communities uh, that a solidarity approach and concerted efforts work better than each community facing and uh, struggling with uh, similar problems. So some messages, we have to act now uh, in spite of climate change uncertainties because we will increase the problems when the, we delay. The uh, acting now is an investment in the future uh, from which we will all uh, benefit. Um, the, this is an important uh, aspect that we try to uh, make clear is uh, combine uh, our knowledge and potential to find solutions and answers. Uh, also, uh, join forces to strengthen our, uh, the community's influence at the state level, uh, <laughs> so your voice uh, will be heard better. Uh, well, that more or less uh, goes in the same direction. We, uh, communities should share burdens and risks and uh, can do that better uh, than by themselves. Uh, so uh, it makes uh, success uh, not only more likely but also more satisfactory. And finally, legal and administrative problems uh, are often very uh, serious hurdles uh, uh, against uh, measurements uh, to be taken and that uh, uh, also is uh, easier uh, when there is a cooperation. So uh, the, the key message is supposed to be uh, not individual uh, fighting or uh, a rat race between communities, but rather a cooperation uh, and uh, a common a consensus on how uh, to, to face uh, the trends and the, the situation. So quickly, okay. Uh, uh, we have uh, managed to increase public awareness uh, mainly uh, through media and public lectures 
but also teaching at university and school level. And uh, I give you um, a, uh, an example. Uh, we uh, established um, an, an open exhibition, a climate pavilion, uh, as a model project for public information. This is the mayor uh, in the community where this pavilion was built, and he did a lot of work onto that. So I skipped that. And uh, uh, how did we achieve it? Uh, <coughs> constant contact and this uh, uh, discussion and uh, cooperation. Uh, strong allies. We have heard this uh, before here in our uh, discussions uh, that uh, take at the local level, take up the message and uh, transport it into uh, other um, spheres and into um, uh, higher, uh, wider uh, cooperation networks. Um, then this is important. Use public media, local media, like newspapers or local television, uh, spread information and raise interests. And, uh, well, of course, workshops. Uh, we uh, have uh, initiated a, collabor a collaboration with uh, tourism decision makers towards that climate friendly image. And so, last, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, per uh, I emphasize this personal contact. Uh, is mandatory, uh, important is to uh, point out and uh, elaborate on possible benefits, not only the risk, but the benefits uh, that may come out of it. And a person that is uh, able and willing to spend a lot of time in the communication and keep the action running and extending positive vibration to the clients. <laughs> and that's uh, Sandra from uh, our uh, network. So uh, she's doing a great job. <laughs> great. Thank you. So this is very much a stage setter for the fishbowl conversation that we're going to have in a minute. So what I would want to uh, suggest right now is if you have clarifying questions. So exactly what did you do in Kiel, whatever then ask those questions now and save the broader lessons, the kinds of things that, you know, that probably translate a lot across the Atlantic. Save those kinds of questions and comments for later. So just clarifying issues right now. How much time was spent on the community outreach and cultivating these relationships? You know, just years, <sighs> months, was it uh, every, week, every two week you gotta have a meeting with people? What was the time? Uh, well, I'm, um, I think um, it's been, uh, it started sl more slowly. Uh, we had like uh, uh, four or five workshops a year uh, that were, were the public meetings between the communities uh, individually, uh, time to, for communication on the telephone or personal visits, I would say uh, probably uh, 10 hours a week. So there is a lot of time uh, necessary to keep the process up. Sure, Paula. Did you identify specific people to bring in to say, you know, yes. even if they were an opposer, you, yes. you identified them and cultivated them to bring in? Yes, yes. Okay. Not just who showed up. Right. Okay. Other clarifying questions? Okay.